Well, good morning. Welcome to Parish Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day morning as we gather as God's people to lift up his name in praise and to honor him for his kindness to us. Uh, we're told over and over again in scripture to run to the fortress that is our God, and to take refuge in him. In Psalm 91, the psalmist says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel.
reading today is from John 15. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah. 
18 through 27. Where John writes, Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be plain that they, are, they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it is, has taught you, abide in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. church where I grew up, we, we had an evening service, and in that evening service, um, we did something that was very un-Presbyterian or Reformed or uh, Frozen Chosen, as we're often called. Uh, we, uh, we took requests, and uh, we sang uh, our favorite songs during the evening uh, often. And one of the requests that often came up was this old hymn that was very, um, well, it wasn't like any other hymns that we typically sang on Sunday morning. And uh, that hymn that often got requested was Victory in Jesus. I don't know if you know that old hymn. Uh, it starts this way. It says, I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. Um, I remember that song very vividly, partly because it was one of my grandfather's favorite songs. And whenever I hear it, I envision him singing it as w I just envision him singing it as well. Um, in our passage this morning, as we go through 1 John chapter 2, uh, John is going to call us to abide in that same old, old story. He's going to get to it in kind of a circular way, as he often does, um, but he's going to remind us of the, the truth of the gospel and then call us to abide in that truth. So as we look at this passage this morning, um, let's pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to enlighten us as we do this. Let's pray. Our most gracious God and our Father in heaven, I pray that you would open up our eyes so that we may see, that you would open our ears that we may hear. Uh, Father, that you would give us hearts and minds to 
uh, to believe and to understand the truth that you have for us today in your word. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing and honoring in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, Before we dive into the passage, just a little bit of context to remind us where we are. Um, John, the disciple of Jesus, the one that Jesus loved, is the one who wrote this book. Uh, We call it a letter, but as you may have noticed, it doesn't have a lot of the same characteristics of a lot of uh, letters, particularly Paul's letters. Um, We could say it's more like a sermon, um, but uh, we can we can call it a, a letter as well. Uh, he wrote it for several different churches. We do know that he was a pastor in the church in Ephesus uh, that came with a great legacy of not only Paul but also Timothy and John. It would have been great to sit under the preaching there in Ephesus. Um, it's quite a list of uh, of heavy hitters there. Um, So what was going on in this church in Ephesus or the churches in particular that John was sending this letter to, this this sermon, uh, what were they struggling with? Now, John doesn't mention it directly, uh, but it could be a a variety of different heresies that that were circulating at the time. Uh, One of them could be an early form of what is called docetism. Um, Just very briefly, um, docetists believe that Jesus only appeared to or seemed to die or seemed to or appeared to be resurrected. The things that we read in the Bible are, aren't actual. They're only uh, appearances. Um, it appeared that he was God's son when he, he really wasn't. And we'll kind of get to that controversy uh, as we walk through First John 2. What we do know is that Jesus, uh, the, the, there were people there who were denying Jesus, and because of that, they were leaving the fellowship. There were some fellowships that were being fractured. Um, It was causing the believers in the churches to begin to really ask some pretty serious questions. Uh, Questions like, what do we do in this situation where people are leaving? How do we handle that? Um, How do we know that we're in the right or they are? Um, how do we have assurance of our own faith and our, our salvation? Uh, how do I know that my faith is actually legitimate? And John's response to them in his, his letter to his dear children is to simply abide in the truth that they have heard from the beginning. <clears throat> he wants them to abide in that old, old story that they know of the gospel. Um, to get there, John kind of circles around until he finally gets to the point. Uh, John reminds me of uh, the pastor that I served under when I uh, was first uh, graduated seminary and my first call. His name is Charlie. Uh, he would often sit me down in his office and he would start on something that seemed so obscure and off the point. And, uh, and I would wonder, like, why is he telling me these things? And he could see the confusion on my face, and he would just take his hand, and he's like, Mike, I'm just going to circle in. I'm eventually going to get there. Just bear with me. <laughs> and uh, I feel like that's what John does here in this letter. He starts uh, what we feel like might be a little obscure, talking about Antichrist this morning, but he'll get into the point. Uh, so this morning, we're going we're gonna to take that route as well. We're going to talk about the last hour, what John means by that. We'll talk a little bit about Antichrist. We'll talk about anointing. And we're going to end where, where John does, where he circles in on this uh, abiding and, uh, and what that means to abide. <clears throat> so John begins in verse 18, where he says, children, it is the last hour. <clears throat> so what does he mean by the last hour? What he's talking about here is the period of time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. Uh, The revelation of the gospel didn't come all at once. It's come in parts. The disciples didn't understand how Jesus was revealing the good news uh, from his Father. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it before, but they were, for the most part, anticipating Jesus to be an earthly king who would usher in an earthly kingdom, maybe even kick out the Romans from uh, their position in Israel. What they did not expect was a suffering servant, like we read in Isaiah 53. 
They didn't expect a Messiah who would come to die. And after his death, they were equally astonished when he was resurrected from the dead. They certainly did not see that coming. After 40 days, Jesus ascended into heaven. It says that a cloud hid them, hid him from their eyes, and he was gone. <clears throat> you know, after Jesus rose from the dead, I would have expected things to play out a little bit differently. It seems like Jesus is in a, a position right now where Satan is on the run. Satan is on the ropes. Why not finish it off right then and there? But no. And this is what surprised his disciples then and what probably surprises us now as well. Uh, not many could foresee that Christ would simply go back to heaven and then return thousands of years later. And we don't know when he will return. We don't know the details. We don't know anything uh, except the Father knows. Um, Jesus doesn't even know the exact date we read. <coughs> Uh, we could have some, some great theological debates uh, here this morning about when and where and, and how and if it's already happened and what. Um, but what John wants us to know this morning is what the last hour, this time that we're experiencing, what it's going to be like. Uh, we read in the Gospels, Jesus tells us um, as he's about to die, he's communicating with his disciples uh, what it's going to be like during this, this time of the last hour. He says it's going to be a time of tribulation, a time of war, where nation will rise up against nation and people against people. People will deny that Jesus is the Christ, which we read about here in John, uh, 1 John 2. False prophets are going to rise up. Those who proclaim Jesus will be hated by all. But the good news of the gospel will be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Um, I don't know about you guys, but it sure sounds like we're living in those last hours, doesn't it? Um, and I can guarantee that every generation since Christ has said those exact same words. It seems like we're living in the last days, these last hours. So how does John tell his readers that they'll know specifically that they are in this last hour? Uh, he says that Antichrist, or what he says here, Antichrist, he says, because of the presence of these Antichrists, you will know that you're in the last hour. So I've got good news for you this morning. I'm finally going to tell you guys who the Antichrist is. You ready? <laughs> So someone shouted out this morning, it's Henry Kissinger. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to reveal that person. Uh, but um, uh, I'm not going to reveal a, a political figure. There's been a lot of people uh, who have um, been put forward as Antichrist, starting all the way back from Nero, uh, even um, people today. <clears throat> uh, we could talk about theories and conspiracies. I think that would take away from what John is really uh, talking about here in this passage, uh, but he makes it very clear, and he tells us who the Antichrist or Antichrists are, and he does it here very, very plainly in verse 22. He says, who is the liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. So who is Antichrist? Who are the Antichrists? They are liars who deny that Jesus is the Christ. Not only Jesus is the Christ, but they deny that uh, the Father and the Son. John, in his circular writing and reasoning, he'll come back to this again in chapter 4, um, but he reiterates the fact that the Antichrist is those who deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. So these aren't minor theological differences that John is speaking to here. Um, he's not talking about people who left because they might have disagreed with the color of the carpet or they're having a worship war in the church and therefore it's being fractured. Uh, it's not even a, a disagreement about sacraments like believers versus infant baptism. 
Uh, these are differences in such core doctrines regarding Jesus that it's Christian versus non-Christian. Um, now, one of the things that, that we learn from this is that we can and we should have fellowship with brothers and sisters, those who may baptize believers instead of infants, those whose worship style is different than our own, uh, those churches who have different color on their carpets. Um, we should have fellowship with them. Um, and we have fellowship with them because we claim foundational truth that we proclaim every week in the Apostles' Creed, that we all believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and so on. Um, and in this creed, we implicitly affirm that Jesus is both God and human. But the nature of Jesus is even more clearly defined uh, for the church in the Nicene Creed. And this creed came about because of the Council of Nicaea, which gathered to combat the Arian controversy, which, um, uh, if you know anything about that, that controversy, it taught that Jesus was not eternal like God the Father. Instead, Jesus was created by God the Father. It created all sorts of difficulty within the Trinity. Um, how can the Father and the Son be one if one made the other? And so we have the Nicene Creed that came out of that. And in one of the, the passages of the Nicene Creed, uh, the writer said this, that we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. He is begotten, not made, and of the same essence as the Father. And through him all things were made. So the Father and the Son are one together, and they are eternal. Uh, so many heresies we've seen throughout the generations. We see a lot even today. Uh, we need to be careful what we label as antichrist. It's not just people who disagree with us theologically. Uh, it's those people who are liars who deny Jesus, who are non-Christians, antichrist. Uh, what we learned from this passage as well this morning is that theology matters. <clears throat> it's important for us to understand and to affirm our core doctrine. We need to be vigilant. We need to pass these doctrines on to our next generation. Uh, we need to have a building where we can have Sunday school so we can pass these on. Uh, and Lord willing, that will happen soon. Uh, we need to know what's true and what's not. And John shows us this morning how we know that. How do we know what is true? Uh, he says you have the truth because you have been anointed by the Holy One. So in John, in 1 John 2.20, he says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. So what is this anointing? It's the Holy Spirit. In 1 John, or, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Who knows the thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So when we are anointed by the Spirit, by the Holy One, we are given the truth. We don't know the whole truth. Only God knows the whole truth. But we do know the core doctrines that Jesus is the Christ. We know that Jesus and the Father are one. And where does this truth come from? Well, there's a song that I love to sing to my kids at night. Um, it goes something like this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Not only does the Bible tell us that Jesus loves us, it gives us the core truth of what we need to know to believe. This is how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Uh, God, uh, Scripture is God's truth breathed out by the Spirit, according to 2 Timothy 3. Uh, Peter reminds us that those who wrote the Scriptures were carried along by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have access to this anointing, to this truth, because God has revealed it to us in his 
word. So if we have this anointing, if we know this truth, <clears throat> Paul finally, or excuse me, John finally gets to the point as he circles in. What should we do with that truth? He says in verse 24, and this is the only imperative that he gives in this passage. Uh, this is his command. Let that what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Well, what was it that they heard from the beginning? Um, John starts off this letter in 1 John 1, verses 5 through 10, reminding us that God is light, and in him there's no darkness. Uh, he wrote the entire gospel of John, uh, and he gives us his purpose statement in John 20, verse 30 through 31. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of these basic core doctrines of Jesus, of who he is and what he's done for us in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you. Unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Jesus Christ died, died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. And he recounts many others that, that Jesus appeared to, and finally he appeared to Paul. Um, so if these are the truths that we need to abide in, these truths we heard from the beginning, the question is, how do we truly do that? How do we abide? What does that look like? We abide by clinging to that old, old story. You know, we are living in the last days. Uh, we have an abundance of antichrists. And it doesn't make life easy right now. And it wasn't easy for the disciples either when Jesus called them to abide in the passage we read in John 15 this morning. Um, abiding means holding fast to Christ in all circumstances, even in ones that are difficult. Um, I know some of your stories this morning. And I know that I'm not the only one who are going through, who's going through things that are difficult. We're living here in the last hour, and it's not easy. We're called to abide in Christ in all circumstances. And abiding in Christ means that we don't get swept up into theological fads. They come and they go. Uh, Spurgeon, preaching many years ago, said this, Many voices clamor for our attention, new philosophies, modern theologies, old heresies revived, and all call us to entreat to listen, but the Father says, hear him, as in Jesus, as if he said, hear him and no one besides. It means listening to that uh, old song that we sing to children as well that goes, read your Bible and pray every day. And we need to spend more time in the Word than we spend online or in social media. Uh, it means that we avail ourselves with the ordinary means of grace. What you're doing here this morning is what it means to abide in Christ. That we avail ourselves of prayer and the preaching of the word, and the celebration of the sacraments, which we're about to do again this morning. Uh, we celebrate that Jesus did the very thing that we are called to here by John, and that Jesus did abide. Um, Jesus went willingly to the cross, and there he did abide. He remained. When people mocked him, when they wanted him to save himself, where they, they called out, he saved himself, he saved others, let him save himself. 
He ignored their cries. He remained with his father. He did abide. When everyone denied him, including his closest disciples, when they left him, he remained with his father. Jesus did abide on our behalf. And John calls us this morning to abide in him. Abide in Christ, the one who died. Abide in Christ, the one who is risen. The one who is coming again. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Let us pray. Our most gracious God and our Father in heaven. Lord, we admit that it is often difficult to abide in you. Lord, the presence of many antichrists and the struggle of this last hour, we find it difficult to abide. Out of the depths we cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear our voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of our pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Let's stand together for our assurance of pardon this morning. Peter reminds us of this great truth. He says that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to your shepherd and to the overseer of your souls. This is the promise of God. This is the word of the Lord. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God. It's our privilege this morning to confess to one another and before a watching world that Jesus is the Christ. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy church, both visible and invisible, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, triune God, and we join our voices with the angels, the archangels, and the whole company of heaven in this hymn of eternal praise. seated. The message that we've just heard is very simple. Abide in Jesus who is the Christ, the Savior. And the, there's a great account of this confession in the Gospel of Mark. Um, it's most likely the account given by Peter, recorded by Mark and writing to Romans. And at the end of his account of the gospel, you have everyone rejecting Jesus and mocking Jesus and putting him to death. And when Jesus breathed his last, there was a Roman soldier there, a centurion. And the Roman soldier, the Gentiles, sees Jesus die. And he says this, truly this man was the Son of God. And it's that confession in which every one of us is saved. It's by abiding in that truth that Jesus is the Son of God who died for you. And Jesus had just taught his disciples how to abide in that truth by giving them a meal. It was when Jesus was eating with his disciples that he took bread and blessed and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So take and drink in remembrance of Christ. So everyone who believes in Jesus is saved in that confession. Jesus is the Christ. Come to this table in that hope. He is your Savior given for you. If you're not a believer in Christ, if you deny that Jesus is the Savior who became flesh and blood and gave himself at the cross, don't come and take this bread and wine. This is not for you. This is for believers. It's a confession of faith. But instead, come to Jesus who loves to save sinners. And there is everlasting life in him. Well, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that Jesus is the Christ. And Lord, we thank you that salvation is so simple 
There was nothing easy about the Son of God becoming man and taking our sins and being nailed to a tree for us. But Lord, it is such a simple gospel. Jesus is the Savior of sinners, and we come to him as sinners. So Lord, we ask that as we come and take bread and wine, please give us the body and blood of Jesus given for us. Lord, fill us with the Spirit and that anointing of truth, and help us to live and abide and remain and stay and make our home in that confession that Jesus is the Christ. And Father, we ask that you would meet with us this morning in his name. Amen. We have three tables. There's one on each side, one in the middle. Find your way to the closest one. And there is gluten-free bread on a white plate. And wine is in the center, grape juice is on the outer ring. And Pastor George will be in the foyer with anyone who'd like to pray. Come to the table of his grace.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, you are our light and our salvation. Therefore, we shall not fear. You are the stronghold, our refuge, our strength. We trust you. We abide in you and your word of truth. Oh, Lord, help us to abide. For we confess our faith in Jesus and trust your promise of eternal life through his perfect work on our behalf. You are the God of our salvation, and you are great in your love towards us. So teach us your ways and lead us in your paths of righteousness for your name's sake. <clears throat> o oh Lord, glorify yourself through building up your church. We pray and we bow down, seeking your face through Jesus and by your spirit for the healing grace that is so needed in our midst for Bev, oh Lord, for Jacqueline, for Tricia, for Perry, for Greg, for Keith, for strength and grace each day for those caregiving, for Susie and Mirandi, Stephanie, Kim, Frank, Nolan, Storm. Lord, for comfort upon comfort, for Covenant School and Covenant Prez, for their elders and deacons and their congregation. Lord, have mercy and give grace each day to walk with you. Oh, Father, we pray for those in Allen, Texas, dealing with the horrific <coughs> shooting there. Lord, bless and comfort those families in their grief. Oh, Father, we pray for our expected mothers and babies for healthy pregnancies as you knit these little ones together. Lord, we praise you for the good news of our building project and continue to pray for your provision. Lord, provide. Lord, we trust you. And for our students and teachers to finish well in this school year, new mercies each day this week. Oh, Father, we pray. For growth and grace in our lives individually, in our families, and in this church, grow us in this truth of eternal life through Christ and cause us to abide in the vine. O oh Lord, with all that is swirling around your church in the world and in the church, O oh Lord, we trust you. We pray for the federal and local magistrates to walk in wisdom from above, your discernment and repentance to lead well. Oh, Lord, we turn our hearts to you to pray that you would revive us again as we pray that prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Stand. Sing. Grace and wisdom grow. 
you would please be seated just for a moment, all except for the Born family, if you would come at this time. Chris and Sarah, I hope you know I've been waiting a long time to ask you a couple of questions. <laughs> it is a great delight uh, to be able to welcome you fully uh, into the communion of our fellowship. Just a couple of questions. Uh, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God? justly deserving his displeasure and without hope except in his sovereign mercy, do you? Yes. Uh, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him and him alone for your salvation as he has graciously offered in the gospel? Do you? Yes. Uh, do you now resolve and promise and humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as faithful, obedient, accountable, and maturing followers of Jesus. Will you? Yes. Uh, do you promise to utilize your gifts and your calling for the support and the work of both the kingdom and of this local church to the best of your ability? Will you? Yes. Uh, do you now submit yourselves to the discipleship, the discipline, and the governance of the elders of this church and the body of Christ in this place and commit to pursue her purity and her peace, will you? Yes. Let me pray for you. Father, I am so grateful for the Born family. I pray that you would use them as trophies of grace in our midst to grow us up in the truth. And I pray that you would bless them, use them for kingdom glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you know the routine, right? you got to go stand at the door with Mike and Jamie and be prepared for anything that comes. <laughs> God bless you. If you would please stand for the Lord's benediction. Now receive the Lord's benediction from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. To Parish Presbyterian Church, we're so thankful uh, to all of our visitors and regular attenders for joining us today. I have a few announcements. Look at your newsletter just as I go through them. Uh, calling on all of our parish families with graduates. If you have not let Alexis know that you have a graduate in your family, please do that today. Her email is there, and we are going to celebrate our graduates on June the 4th. We also have a missions trip to Dalton, Georgia, a dinner fundraiser, and there's a QR code right here. If you plan on going to that, they need you to sign up today. We would love to have that so that they know how many people are coming for that dinner. It's on May the 10th at 6.30. And also on May the 17th, it's on the back of your newsletter, is a special dessert and coffee hour with the Skeenstra family that the missions team is putting on. So come on uh, May the 17th, Wednesday night at 6.30 for that special occasion. We also have uh, a way to support the Pregnancy Centers of Middle Tennessee. Next uh, Lord's Day, you can pick up a bottle and fill it up with all your change and bring it back on May the 28th. 
uh, see those bottles for next Lord's Day. And then we also have a new book of the month, Adoring God by our own Keith Nell. I would encourage you to grab one of these for your own spiritual development. Go in the grace and love of Christ. Mm-hmm.